Right, this is something completely different. This is not about research, but about the use we can make of research. One of my big concerns is that though we are now learning an awful lot about Repton, we can daily see Repton disappearing. We've heard a lot about Repton who has disappeared. And this is about one site I've been involved in for 15 years. This is the story of Pan's Hanger in Hertfordshire, near Hartford, uh, currently under threat from about 50,000 houses round about. And this is part of the landscape. This is not the Repton landscape, you'll be relieved to hear. This is the Capability Brown landscape. <laughs> this was 200, 2013, just as we were gearing up for Capability Brown to centenary. Um, and this is tarmac remodeling it in their inimitable fashion. It's now a 30 meter hole. But if we go back to the, uh, uh, the estate, the Capability Brown landscape was on one side of a valley. It fell into disrepair because the current owner preferred to live in Florence for some reason and never came back, even when he was elected the local MP. And so the heir, when he finally inherited 1799, decided he'd move lock, stock and barrel across the valley to the other side. And he called in Repton's, uh, produced this red book, 1799. At this time, Repton seems to be very keen on getting a house built. He obviously needed a new house, and so Repton came up with some ideas. So what we have here is a before view looking across the valley towards the old Capability Brown one. As you can see, it is very boring. But as you can see now, it's a lot less boring because we've dammed our little baby river into a nice broad water and we've got our nice three cows good, nice picturesque cows, our movement, our animation on the water. And he, he did do quite a lot of work at Pan's Hanger. So this is looking the other side. Nasty ploughed field, can't have that, get rid of it. And we have a couple of different designs for houses. This illustrate his idea of having a house halfway up a hill so you get the best views. Sadly for him, he didn't get the commission for the house. It wasn't built where he wanted it, and he was just stuck with doing the landscape. There is quite a lot there that you can read in the landscape. This isn't in the Red Book, but there is a lot that has been recently discovered by our researchers in the archives, in the Cooper archives of the family. So here you can see a typical sculpted edge to the woodland, a bit compromised because it is now an eco zone with bracken. That's another battle. We have some of his bursts, and this should center on a beautiful oak just round the corner. And as you come round this corner, you see first the oak, then you turn around a bit further, you see a glimpse of the house a bit further, and you see the long broad water all of which is currently obscured. We also have some peeps going down from a hilltop ride. This is one of them. They have marker trees at the bottom, sentinel trees at the top. We don't know from the Red Book that Repton actually laid this out, but we do know from the accounts that they were laying out plantations according to Mr. Repton's design and this is very Reptonian in feel. We also have some interventions like this, which was another of his views down from the hilltop ride to the valley and across. And we have some really rather awful um, fencing. Um, I sometimes wonder if the owners have shares in uh, barbed wire manufactory because there is just so much barbed wire everywhere. This site is open to the public and in my view you shouldn't have it where small boys can be pushed by bigger sisters into fences. 
So here we've got lots of nice barbed wire, we've got a very inappropriate fence, and we've got lots and lots of little sheds. Now, we don't know much about this little house. It's a little lodge. It's at a key point in the landscape, in the views up and down and across. And we think it may be something that Repton embellished. But it certainly deserves a better setting than that, as I have said many, many times. The other thing that is happening is that because it is being managed as a wildlife site, wildlife comes first. And I'm sure some of you have come across that. So the top is the view up Repton's Valley before they decided that people walking along the bottom might upset the birds. Now we had a great battle over this because the bird species changed every time you asked which bird got upset. But whatever happened is that we now have a nice fence, as you can see, with letterbox views so you can look through the letterbox if you want to get Repton's view. But given that Repton's views are often taken as moving views, we think this is inadequate. Um, nobody's asked the birds, so we don't quite know if they approve. And again, here is this fence, but it's also allied to this really industrial, agricultural looking uh, infrastructure, which we have been trying very hard to get them to replace with something a bit more appropriate for a historic landscape. One of the things that, the last things they've done, because they've now finished gravel extraction, is to extract this last heap. It was, as I say, a Repton landscape. They ran out of airs. The house was uh, sold for demolition, uh, demolished, and then the landscape was sold for gravel extraction, which they actually got permission on appeal in 1982. Since then, they have been extracting madly, and the idea was it would be returned to the public as a country park, incrementally as they did bit by bit. Uh, this has only just started to happen after a great deal of public uh, agitation. So what we have in the foreground here, this piece of water is Repton's lower broad water, a lovely sinuous shape, and at the back is a new lagoon that they have dug all this wonderful gravel from. And this is Repton's sketch of the landscape, and I don't know if you can see, but the grey bit on this side of the water is where they've dug this new lagoon. And what happened was that it was suggested to me that as Repton did vast lakes rather than broad waters, um, it wouldn't matter if they cut out the little strip. And here you can see we have Repton's broad water marked on. You have Tarmac's lagoon which they've already had to fill in a bit because they over-extracted according to their planning permission. And we have that little strip that they wanted to take out to make this nice big thing. Um, I did talk to the quarry managers and they said it would actually cost more to take it out than they would earn in gravel taken out of it. So we started a campaign. And this is one of the images we used in our campaign to actually stop the destruction of the Broadwater. And so we have the Friends, we had Hertfordshire Gardens Trust, and we produced lots of little leaflets and flyers and a website and everything. We got the local press in interested um, because we have found that if you want to counter something like corporate vandalism, Bad publicity is the best weapon you've got. And well, there was plenty of bad publicity on this one. And I've given him a nice face because I didn't think it was fair to show his face. This is Jack. This is Jack the Giant Slayer, as we call him. Jack was so upset, having used the park and come with his dad, that he decided he ought to do something. Sadly, he was only 12 at the time, so his idea of starting an online petition could not have got off the ground because 
you're not allowed to do that if you're only 12. So he hijacked his dad's email and he started an online petition. And it was a very successful petition. It caught the eye of the local press. They advertised it. And lo and behold, the owners started to backtrack about, well, you know, we might not do this, you know, uh, if it would really upset people. Um, so we were very pleased, and um, Jack came around to lots of events and um, made, made his point that it was a perfectly lovely landscape and he didn't want it spoiled. The best piece of evidence we had was the account books from the archives. Now, one of our researchers did an awful lot of work on this, which appears in our Repton book, um, on what Repton was doing at Panshanger. And at a meeting with the powers that be who wanted to take out this landscape, I produced this photocopy of the book. And there it says that they are digging out the broad water under the supervision of Mr. Repton. And we know that at one point there were at least 104 people on site uh, working on this landscape. And it was that research combined with the actual bad publicity, especially that engendered by Jack, that caused them to change their minds. And the landscape has not been further trashed, and I am now actively involved in going around and giving them good ideas on what they need to do, which I've been doing for 15 years, but now they're listening. So here we have the view from what was the house platform across the broad water and in the background across that horrible lagoon. They had, at our suggestion, removed a lot of the scrub so you can actually see it. And a further refinement is that they are opening up the sides of the view and you can see this brown stuff on the left where they've just cleared it. Having done that, they've got to go back and clear some more scrub over there to open up the view. At, in the back, you can probably see there's a V-shape of the grass with a signal tree. That is one of Repton's views down that you can see from this side, but you can't see from the ride. We do have some of his views, his little peeps, opened up across the landscape. But there is an awful lot more to do. This is one that we have just discovered in a part of the landscape that has been shut to the public. It still is, but we were allowed in, where there is a glade of trees. We don't know if they're Reptonian, but Repton certainly was working in this area. So this is a work in progress where we're using the research that has been done, very good, solid research, to actually make a difference, to stop further bad things happening to it and to make some good things happen to it. And I think that's enough for us to do to ensure that there is something left for future generations. Thank you.